something strange is happening. We're slowly but surely turning away the car. Not because of climate change, traffic jams or high costs, as one might think, but because of other, less obvious reasons. According to research, young people, for instance, have in recent years been much less interested in cars and driving. That information, together with accelerating technological developments in transportation, could in the coming years lead to radical changes in the way we move around. We're saying goodbye to the car. This is what's coming up. Driving has become so ingrained in the American culture, but I really like that it has almost turned around where young people aren't seeing driving as important. Well, I don't think we should let autonomous cars distract us from the much more important thing, which is uh, electrification of transport, sustainable transport. That is by far the most important thing. Suddenly you can bring huge uh, productivity improvements and cost improvements just by knowing everything every a minute of the day. This is Backlight. Welcome to your future. Even if we stuck to the old model and tried to sell a car to every single individual, where are those cars going to go? Uh, who can afford them? And how are you going to garage them? Uh, you can't, is the short answer. So I believe that, that the freedom of mobility does not necessarily equate with the freedom of individual ownership. There will be some of that, but there will be many, many other forms of you know, shared mobility, which will give you individual freedom. It just may not be under the current uh, economic model that we have today. Hold on. If Bill Ford, chairman of one of the world's biggest car manufacturers, says that you might not own a car in the future, there's clearly something going on. How we get from A to B is changing rapidly. Since a couple of years, the love of cars is declining, especially among the younger generation. They have no emotional attachment with cars, like many people over 30. This is Carlo van der Weijer. He is head of the Smart Mobility Department at the Eindhoven University of Technology and looks at how people move around. He still has a thing for cars, but mostly just this one. This is my first auto. When I just studied, I bought it. But there were only two people who drove it. So I had it all looked at when I got it. There was a beautiful old woman in Limburg, and she said, "Oh, that's my Peugeot. Daar heb ik mijn eerste kind nog in gemaakt. Dat is het eerste wat ze zei. Zo'n auto kun je nog restaureren. Er lopen maar vijf draden naar voren en, 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 en drie naar achter. Dus dat is, het elektrische systeem is allemaal veel makkelijker. Maar alle onderdelen, het zijn een beperkt aantal onderdelen, zijn allemaal nog goed te krijgen. Het is ook fijn dat ze nog in Afrika rondrijden, dus daar wordt het allemaal nog gemaakt. Maar het is gewoon allemaal heel simpel. En, uh, zo'n moderne auto met alles van draad en zo. En als je één apparaatje weghaalt, dan werkt het andere niet meer. Dat is bijna niet meer te doen. Dus uh, daar kun je ook niet zomaar een onderdeel bij vervangen. Je moet op een bepaalde manier behandelen, anders start hij niet. Ja, dus zes keer de gaspedaal aantrekken, dan de shock eruit trekken, dan een keer starten en dan doet hij het niet meer als hij koud is. En dan, nou, dan kan een keer aaien en dan praktisch is het niet zwaar karakter. Dus als je snel ergens naartoe moet, dan, uh, dan zijn er betere opties tegenwoordig. Ja. The most common way that I get around from point A to point B is walking. Um, I walk from my house to class, from my class home. Most of my stuff is on the way. Um, if I'm going further, I'll take the subway system. Um, and occasionally, if I really need a car, I'll use the program called Zipcar, where it's a car sharing program. Um, but even if I had a lot of money, I wouldn't buy a car um, because in Berkeley, there are so many options. Um, also, parking is really terrible here in in Berkeley and in most cities, um, so it's nice not to have to worry about that. Well, the first time I drove a car was, on, was with my grandparents, um, and so they actually let me drive a really expensive, like, Jaguar, <laughs> and so my, my grandma was not happy with my grandfather about that, um, but I didn't, I didn't destroy it, nothing bad happened. <laughs> Um, but I think that it wasn't necessarily the driving that was a special part. It was like having that bonding moment with my grandparents. 
I remember that more than like the actual feeling of driving. But I really like that it has almost turned around where young people aren't seeing driving as important. Um, because you can still make memories without a car. You can have all those bonding moments on a bus or while you're walking. In fact, it's almost easier because there's not one person who's focused on driving and can't be a part of it. I have noticed that young people nowadays are less likely to buy a car than those in previous generations. It's not really seen as a sense of status or freedom anymore. I think there are new status symbols that have replaced out of a car, um, like having a nice smartphone. Everybody's like, oh my god, the newest phone. Um, I mean, I only have like a four, an iPhone 4S, but like when the newest like iPhone 5C or whatever came out, everyone was like, oh my gosh, I need to get it, or the newest LG phone or whatever. Yeah, people pay more attention to stuff like that nowadays. Een aantal jongeren wat automatisch een auto wil als ze 18 zijn of er zelfs een rijbewijs, dat, dat neemt af. Dat zijn alle onderzoeken die, die tonen dat aan. Het is heel sterk in Japan, ook redelijk sterk in de Verenigde Staten. Hier in Europa is het een duidelijke trend, uh, hoewel nog wat zwakker. Auto betekende vrijheid vroeger. Dat is nu nog zeker als je niet in de stad woont, dan heb je een auto nodig om je vrijheid te bereiken. Maar in de stad, en veel jongeren trekken naar de stad, uh, betekent een auto eerder beperking van vrijheid. Daar moet je dat ding erg stallen. Het kost gewoon heel veel geld een auto te hebben in de stad. En je ziet die groep heel snel bewegen naar, uh, ja, die proberen wel gebruik te maken van een auto, maar die hoeven er niet per se een te bezitten. Maar daarnaast zie je ook wel dat, dat jongeren heel vaak online willen zijn. Dat is lastig in een auto, dat is makkelijker in openbaar vervoer en andere vervoersvormen. En je ziet ook dat bij volwassenen bijvoorbeeld uh, beginnen te merken dat je in de trein veel makkelijker kunt werken dan in de auto. Een paar jaar geleden was werken nog heel veel bellen, tegenwoordig is dat heel snel uh, ook terug aan het lopen. Dus ook die groep gaat veel liever met andere vervoersmethoden als dat beter is. Young people's declining interest in cars and driving has got through to the big car manufacturers. One after the other, they've started projects to get millennials back behind the wheel. General Motors started a collaboration with TV channel MTV. And Japanese car manufacturer Nissan set designers to work. The starting point was the young generation, the, what we call the Z generation. And we found out that these people are not, let's say, so interested in car. We have to find a way to connect with these people who, believe me, are very, very far right now from the automotive world. It's not pretentious, it's not luxury, it's not high performance kind of flavor. It's just something like you have a pair of jeans. Ja, Honda heeft een keer een heel, uh, die zag die trend in Japan is die namelijk loopt een beetje voor en die zagen een trend dat uh, dat dat jongeren gingen afhaken. Dus dan hebben ze hele hippe auto's voor, met met rekjes voor surfborden en andere zaken gedaan en die dat is een gigantisch succes geworden bij juist de oudere mensen. Dus dat is Ik, ik, ik denk dat ze het ook wel proberen. Ik denk dat het toch een algemene trend is van de informatietijdperk wat toeslaat. Young people's attitude toward cars is not the only thing that has changed in recent years. Cars too are changing rapidly. Ja, een auto is gewoon een computer op wiel geworden eigenlijk. Het is niet meer dat mechanische fenomeen van vroeger. Het is, uh, Als je ook kijkt hoeveel rekenkracht er in auto's zit, die Mercedes S-klasse heeft iets van 200 miljoen lijntjes code. Dat is ongeveer 100 keer meer dan een Boeing 747. Er zitten 70 computers in. En dat is één grote datamachine. Dat is echt een high-tech systeem op wielen. Mercedes heeft ook gezegd dat de belangrijkste reden dat ze nog wielen onder de auto bouwen is om te voorkomen dat de computers over de straat slepen. En dat zeiden ze zelf. Dus... Waarom wilde je deze auto dan? Het is uh, een van de eerste auto's waardoor mensen elektrische auto's willen gaan rijden. Het is echt een fantastische wagen. Ja? Ja, echt. Geweldig. 
Wegleggen is heel goed omdat de batterij allemaal uh, heel laag liggen. Dus... Dus heel het dashboard zit er met twee knoppen. Dus het alarmlicht en uh, een, een uh, handschoenenvakje. En al de rest gaat hier via een touchscreen. En dat is verrassend goed gemaakt. Dus het, is echt, het werkt allemaal heel intuïtief. The relatively new Tesla has attracted a lot of attention with its full electric cars. The CEO of Tesla, Elon Musk, visited the Netherlands shortly and got a hero's welcome. He answers questions from people who bought the car and gives his vision on the development of cars. I think a good approach here would be to uh, have used networked intelligence, have the Teslas communicate with one another and take data sources from uh, other vehicles that are on the road. How many computers are there in a Model S Tesla? It's 53. Yeah. The, the Tegra 3, which is what powers the center display. Uh, then there's the Tegra 2, which powers the instrument cluster. And the other computers are much less powerful. And I should mention another important thing uh, is that the, the car is also connected. So it's not just computers, but it's also connected via the cell phone system and uh, Wi-Fi. So we can keep updating the software and the car is in real-time communication with the internet. I, I do think there's a significant opportunity for um, having uh, kind of fleet intelligence uh, for navigating traffic and um, uh, you know, identifying where there's been an accident or as you say, a pothole or some kind of issue. Um, it's kind of like crowdsourcing, you know, but you know, for, from the car standpoint. Um, n networked intelligence, I think, can be very powerful um, and uh, make, make a big difference. Er nou, wordt hier in de regio Eindhoven Helmond wordt heel veel getest met nieuwe voertuigen. Met connected voertuigen, dus voertuigen die met elkaar praten, maar, maar ook met oudste deel autonoom kunnen rijden. Dus daar gaan we nou naar kijken. Dit zijn drie auto's die deels autonome functionaliteit hebben. Nice. Dus die kunnen ook als ze op de weg zijn, kunnen ze de lijnen volgen en de auto's voor zich volgen en dan automatisch afstand houden. Mm -hmm. maar wat zij ook doen is dat ze met elkaar praten. Dus ze zijn connected vehicles. Dat wil zeggen dat is de voorste rente die ze meteen deelt met alle anderen. En die kunnen er al rekening mee houden, zodat ze een veel kortere afstand van elkaar kunnen houden. Het werkt met drie, maar het werkt ook met een hele slinger van twintig auto's. Als je goed weet wat, 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 wat je van elkaar doet, dan, ja, dan kun je veel functionaliteit aan die auto overgeven en dan krijg je een veel beter rijpatroon. Dus rijden nou die, die tweede en de derde van die auto's, die, uh, die raken hun pedalen niet aan op dit moment. Uh, ja, wat die auto's eigenlijk doen is een, een omgevingbeeld schetsen. Die hebben ogen en oren, dus het, zeg maar, radar en camera zitten erin, uh -huh. zodat ze weten wat ze moeten doen. En, uh, wat we nu aan toevoegen zijn is om ook stuurfunctionaliteit bij te zetten. Dat ze, en, en die hebben dat al in een beperkte mate, zodat je ook in de bochten gewoon kunt volgen wat de andere auto doet. En zo zie je dat er eigenlijk steeds meer functionaliteit van de mens naar de auto toestroomt. Is het mogelijk dat jouw gap is groter dan mijn? Wat je wel ziet is dat er al functionaliteit van die auto die dan uiteindelijk alles zelf kan doen, die zie je hier al in terugkomen. En dit is heel nuttige functionaliteit om het verkeer nu al veiliger mee te maken en, uh, en zuiniger. En je kunt er ook files mee oplossen als je hier door auto's dichter bij elkaar kunt laten rijden. Uh -huh. En allemaal schokgolven die vaak files uh, tot gevolg hebben, die kun je allemaal voorkomen. Dus dat zijn al functionaliteiten die, die het verkeer wel verbeteren. Helemaal automatisch kun je met deze auto's nog niet rijden. Nou, dit, dit zijn wel de technieken die, die in die richting gaan. Ik vind het weer het snelheidsverschil te groot, maar er is niks aan de hand, zoals je ziet. Je hebt nog steeds geen pedaal aangeraakt. Ik heb nog steeds geen pedaal aangeraakt. Nee hoor. Blijf gewoon doorgaan. Ja, iedereen bespaart dus brandstof. Kijk, en dan heb je iets waar een vervoerder wel wat voor voelt natuurlijk. Van het automatisch remmen van vrachtwagens. Dat gaat uh, verplicht worden van 2015. Dat is super. En dat scheelt een hoop als ze even naar een ongevallen. En vol gas hier uh, naar deze bocht. Nou, 
man. Hopla, laatste man. Kijk. Het leuke is dat je geen moment het gevoel hebt dat het onveilig is als je rent. Nee, dat zo. Dat van, nou, dus. ja. En het, het zenuwachtig is ook echt uit. Ja. Zet, zet stuur ook even aan. En, uh, kijk kijk hoe, hoe die werkt. Nou, automatisch sturen. Alles los. Oké, okay, ja. Alles los. Krantje erbij. Ja. Op koffie. Nou, je, 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 je houdt nog de verantwoordelijkheid, hè? Oh ja. Nou, ja, ja oké. Okay. Ja, je gaat er wel een beetje op vertrouwen als het werkt. Uh, dan, uh, dan merk je dat je okay. aandacht verslapt. Het grootste verschil van de auto van nu en van over een tijdje het is allemaal elektronica en software. En uh, daardoor zie je ook de ontwikkeling in die automotive industrie ineens veel sneller gaan. Alles met elektronica te maken heeft, groeit exponentieel. Dat zie je ook met, met geheugenprijzen, met de kracht van computers. Dat ongeveer elk jaar, dat heet de wet van Moore, elk jaar wordt dat twee keer sterker. Kun je met een, of, of een geheugenkaartje worden twee keer goedkoper elk jaar. Dus dat is echt een exponentiële groei. En dat is dus heel iets anders dan het beetje lineaire patroon wat die automotive industrie altijd gevolgd heeft. The increasing number of computers in cars has changed the industry drastically. Not only for the first time in decades did it allow a newcomer, Tesla, to enter the market, but it has partly shifted the development of cars from places like Detroit to Silicon Valley, the domain of computers and the internet. Almost every car manufacturer has opened a development center there. Like Japan's Nissan, whose center is headed by Dutchman Maarten Schierhuis. Het talent wat je nodig hebt, bevindt zich hier. Je zit allemaal in Silicon Valley. Um, dus dit is onze, ja, onze research ruimte, zeg maar. Hier waar uh, uh, alle auto's zijn uh, waarmee we werken. En hier zie je onze Autonomous Vehicle Development Car, die we gebruiken op dit moment om, uh, ja, om onze software uh, te creëren en te testen. En dit is de auto die ook zometeen in Silicon Valley zal gaan rijden. In eerste instantie is een, een automobielbedrijf geen softwarebedrijf. En hoe je een, een, een fysiek uh, een auto bouwt en dan ook nog software daarvoor bouwt en dat, 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 is, uh, uh, ja, dat, dat is geen makkelijk uh, uh, probleem. Dat digitaliseren van de maatschappij uh, creëert meer service, uh, uh, een maatschappij van services dan van producten, fysieke producten. Um, en ja, uh, daar moeten autofabrikanten zich ook uh, mee bezighouden. Apart van Tesla, every car manufacturer nowadays has a research center there. Yeah, I'm not sure what they're doing, but <laughs> <laughs> they do have research centers there, yeah. Well, why have they all moved to Silicon Valley, you think? Well, they haven't moved to Silicon Valley. I think a lot of comics have established research centers there because they need to understand what's going on in Silicon Valley. I don't think they fully believe what's happening there. I mean, you need to be immersed in Silicon Valley to really understand what's going on. You can't just have like a little satellite office. In order to attract the best engineers, they have to believe that you're really serious about advanced technology. That's a, I think like a lot of the comicers have trouble making that argument, because they're not. <laughs> Particularly with electronics and software in, in cars, you could go back like five years, ten years, like so you, compared to what you use in your daily life, in your cell phone or your computer. I mean, like, Audi still has, like, an amber screen. I mean, I haven't had an amber screen since 87, you know. Literally, I had an amber screen in 87. Um, I don't even know where you've... I mean, like, where do you even find someone to, to build, build something like that? Digitalization has already changed cars on the inside. We ask David Frickstedt, a Silicon Valley consultant, whether it will change the world around the car. I think so, because uh, the digital... Transportation in the digital realm is going to be the same thing as, as we've seen in journalism. Uh, digital realm has taken over news and music and entertainment. Uh, it's done the same in the, in the information and consulting industry that I'm in. It'll be the same in uh, transportation. There'll still be physical uh, elements 
but the vast majority of the value added is going to be digital. And it's, people would say, well, it'll never change. You know, men always want to drive their car. This is the way it always has to be. I want my privacy. And these are all resistance to changes, and, and you can see the change everywhere, but they continue to say there'll always be cars. The big automotive players will always be big automotive players. And it's simply not true, and, it's, and that's why a Kodak moment is coming. So what happened in Kodak's case is when the digital signal processing chip started to come out in the early 1980s, you could see with uh, Moore's Law, it's a fu function of math, that someday film would get replaced. And they always said film will always be here, people. It'll never be replaced. I mean, I remember hearing these over the years. And, you know, Kodak had 90% market share. It was a $30 billion market cap company. And, pff, you know, overnight it's, it's gone. Who understands the development of software and computers better than any car manufacturer? Exactly. Google. Some time ago, the internet company announced it would enter the car industry with the development of a fully autonomous car. A car that doesn't need a driver. And that could just change the world drastically. I don't think there will be anything in my lifetime that will be as revolutionary as autonomous driving. And, and Google's making the biggest promises, talking about 2018 to have autonomous cars out there. You know, let's pray it works, because it has uh, profound implications on our society and, and the world. It is mind-blowing, and, and it's the domino effect of all of the other things we look at when you look at what does autonomous driving mean to our society, to our kids, to our lifestyle, to our productivity. It changes everything. It, it sounds crazy, but it's the empowerment of children. Because you can't drive until you're 16 in this country now, which means your mother or your father has to be a work-at-home mom or uh, take time off to drive the kids to soccer practice and violin practice and all this. I mean, literally, it's a huge loss of productivity of a very el uh, driving element of our society, uh, wasted sitting behind cars. So you look at, you know, a billion children being able to get where they need to go with safety. Uh, you know, I also have, you know, some an aging parent who's about to lose uh, their driver license. And this is a unbelievable hit to the to the psyche well I'm fortunate to know that when I when they're ready to take my driver's license away there will be a Google car or somebody's car will be available that I don't have to worry about it so I think it's that empowerment of all people to have uh, a right of mobility Google believes the autonomous car is the solution to many problems for example, autonomous cars are much safer than human drivers, and a blind person can travel independently. What do you want? What do you want to do today, Steve? I'm, I'm all for talking about myself. 95% of my vision is, is gone. I'm well past legally blind. Where this would change my life is to give me the independence and the flexibility to go the places I both want to go and need to go when I need to do those things. You know, there's other uh, implications for what happens when it becomes autonomous. There's a million drivers on the planet, people that drive taxis and trucks. What are they going to do when, they, uh, when you don't need them anymore? Um, the li driver's license bureaus, uh, you know, a mile from here is a 12-lane highway. I don't think uh, if it was fully automated and mesh networked controlled, meaning um, your car would say, now is the time you should go to work, or now is the time you should go this way. 
I don't think you'll ever need more than a two-lane highway. And uh, it has profound implications for the people that make highways, that administrate highways, that care for highways, all the 3M equipment for signs and all the stuff they make. It's, it's up for grabs, I think. The idea of a self-driving car is not new. Back in the 1950s, car manufacturers already had a vision of a driverless future. Hey, I wonder what we'd hear if I'd turn on the switch and we're driving along in 1976. Roger Firebird 2, move to electronic control strip in center lane. Well done, Firebird 2. You're now under automatic control. Hands off steering. Want some ice cream or a cool drink? Orange juice, please. Oh, me too. I'm gonna go for the ice cream. Self-driving cars have been 20 years away ever since the 1930s. At the World's Fair in New York, they were going to come in 1958. In 1958, they are going to be here in the 70s. In the 90s, they are going to hear it by today. Um, so the good news is that now they're only 10 years away instead of 20. So, you know, ask me again in 2023, right? <laughs> Bryant Walker Smith is a fellow at Stanford University and studies the legal and ethical questions surrounding self-driving cars and he still sees a few potential roadblocks. I will, what, what you can say is, first of all, nothing will be as we expected it. So by the time we have truly self-driving cars, well, maybe at that point, we'll get most of our products delivered by drone or small delivery robot, and the ones that we don't get delivered will have printed on 3D printers. The world will look different. In terms of this shift toward automation, though, um, you know, we'll see automation on highways quicker than that, potentially. Um, with the human engagement, a question of the technology and a question of the law. Do, you know, do I still have to pay attention or not? The long-term vision of a, of a car that takes you to work while you're asleep in the back, um, that's, that's pretty distant. It, it gets exponentially hotter because when you make a car that can do, say, 99%, that's one thing, but then 99.9, 99.99, 99.999, you know, it, it gets, each, each one of those is a factor of 10 hotter um, and, and requires just a, an enormous amount of testing because all, all you need is like one corner case situation to go wrong and, you know, be terrible. So. It, it's hard to say when the exact time is for, for full autonomy. I think, I think it's going to be a lot further out than people think. The, the phrase that we like to use at Tesla is more like autopilot. Mm -hmm. in like in a plane, you still have pilots, but you engage the autopilot, and that uh, reduces the pilot fatigue um, and, and improves reliability. So I think that's the approach that we'll be taking, which is, is kind of the autopilot approach. In de file rijden, wat je nu al ziet, dat zijn relatief makkelijke zaken. Of de Amsterdamse gracht rijden uh, en dan iemand zo passeren met 10 centimeter verschil, dat durven wij als mensen wel, want wij hebben wel in de gaten of die persoon jou hoort of niet. Dat zou een autonoom voertuig nog, tot in de, nog, nog, nog lange tijd ontzettend moeite mee hebben. The threshold of safety for an autonomous car is extremely high. It's higher than for a person. The goal must, it mustn't just be, oh, we want to be as good as a person. We've got to be like 10 times better than a person. Because you can imagine the first time an autonomous car maybe injures somebody, people will be up in arms. So it's just a much higher standard than we would apply to a person. Ja, de, de moeilijkste zaken voor autonome voertuigen, wat je vaak hoort uit de industrie, zijn, zijn die dingen waar wij als mens heel erg goed in zijn. Dat als je ergens rijdt, en je ziet iemand op de op trottoir staan, dat jij kunt inschatten of hij jou gezien heeft. En uh, maar je ziet ook van, hé, hey, die ziet mij niet en die wil oversteken. Of je ziet, je ziet, je ziet een bal uh, de weg opbutsen, dan kun je van, oh, daar kan misschien een kind achteraan komen. Dat zijn van die heel moeilijke zaken waar wij enorm bijna in ons onderbewustzijn kunnen beslissen en kunnen inschatten wat er gebeurt. En dat zijn eigenlijk nog wel de moeilijkste technische uitdagingen voor de toekomst. Well, I don't think we should let autonomous cars distract us from the 
much more important thing, which is uh, electrification of transport, mm -hmm. sustainable transport. That is by far the most important thing. I mean, autonomous cars, it's, that, that's like, okay, nice to have, you know, would alleviate the driving burden. Um, but, you know, we'll be fine if we don't have autonomous cars. The world's not going to, you know, nothing terrible is going to happen. Look, if we don't have autonomous, autonomous cars, it's not, it's not a problem. Um, uh, but if we don't go to sustainable transport, then um, we'll eventually, we'll run out of hydrocarbons to mine and the economy will collapse. But well before that, we're going to do a tremendous amount of damage to the environment. So, um, you know, it's, it's kind of like smoking. You know, it's like smoking, but it's like the whole planet is smoking, literally. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so, um, you know, if we, if, we, if we can't solve sustainable transport, we are in deep shit. You know. The autonomous car is maybe best put on hold. But there are other developments, less visible, but with a lot of impact, that will change the ways in which we travel from point A to point B. Like the fact that young people, even in car-crazy America, are less interested in cars than they used to be, and turn to other modes of transport. Your car is no longer that gateway to an adventure. Your car is now how you get to your job and how you do errands. And it's just, it's just like a, you know, your business coat. You put it on in the morning, there's no uh, romance in it. Ever since I came to college here at Berkeley, I've been uh, riding my bike everywhere. It's been really interesting coming up here and um, not needing to drive anywhere. In fact, like when you get in a car, it's kind of like, oh, these things can take me places. They're not just things to dodge when you're on your bike. All I do is go to school and maybe the supermarket, and I just have a bike for all that. I don't, I don't need a car. Riding a bike is definitely a lot less frustrating than driving a car because if you don't like how somebody's going, you can always just swerve around them. You can always take another route. Even though you're not supposed to, you can always just jump on the sidewalk and get off. Whereas a car, you're locked in by the traffic gods, by where you can't go. Cars will always have their place. And who knows what happens with driverless cars when we're all driving really close together. And at 400 miles per hour and you don't even need to own a car because the car will just drop you off and it will just pick someone else up. The lack of interest from the younger generation in owning a car is an opportunity to reimagine the way in which we transport ourselves. And as it turns out, there are much better solutions. Ninety-eight percent of uh, combustion engines sit idle. That's a tremendous amount of waste. You know, you'd never see that on a factory floor. A factory would never stay in business if it had that much waste. So, you know, every American owns two or three cars. They sit idle, but they have them because I need a sports car then, and I need a, a van for the soccer kids then, and I need this and that. So. And you see that all over the planet, that most 98% of cars sit idle. If we look at parking, it's just idle land with a bunch of idle uh, capital sitting on it. So that's a waste. And it's the fuel systems, it's the getting stuck in traffic. There's a million implications of where that waste is. And, and the technology is available today to, to fix it. It's how fast uh, can we integrate, share, cooperate to make it happen. For decades, the efficiency of how we transported ourselves was not up for debate. Driving around in your own car was the way things were. But in recent years, new car sharing initiatives like Snapcar have popped up.
Ik heb een auto. Het is een Audi A3, een kleine, maar toch een redelijk luxe auto. Daar staat hij. Deze auto die, die staat uh, heel veel voor de deur, leeg, ongebruikt. En uh, ik zat al lang te zoeken naar een mogelijkheid om het eigenaarschap te delen met andere mensen. Mm -hmm. En ja, ik ben op Snapcar gekomen omdat ze bemiddelen tussen mij en iemand anders uh, in de buurt die toevallig een auto nodig heeft. Ah, hey, hallo. Dag Walter. Dag. Dat gaat het wel met jou? Ja, goed. Ja. Oké. Okay. Ik pak even een In het algemeen zijn mensen ja, die wonen op loopafstand of, uh, of op vijf minuten fietsen hier vandaan. En ja, we, we lopen met checklistje langs. Wat staat daar? Ik probeer er uh, eigenlijk vooral mijn kosten uit te halen. Hè, dat ik mijn auto kan houden uh, zonder uh, dat het me al te veel kost. Nou, jij krijgt de papieren mee, die zitten in dit map. Als je hem aan anderen meegeeft, dan moet je toch in, in zekere zin moet je hem een beetje loslaten, die auto. Dan is het niet meer dan een gebruiksvoorwerp. Ik had een auto tot een aantal jaar geleden. En die auto heb ik op een zeker moment van de hand gedaan, omdat er iedere keer hele hoge reparatiekosten waren. En toen besloten we om naar een alternatief te zoeken. Verhuurorganisaties, openbaar vervoer en dus op een gegeven moment ook Snapcar. Meestal moet je op een bedrijventerrein zijn in Den Haag om uh, een auto te kunnen huren. En uh, de auto's van Snapcar die bevinden zich werkelijk hier in de straten van de buurt waar ik woon. Ik denk dat dat steeds minder auto's zullen gaan worden. Dat mensen inzien hoe verschrikkelijk duur autorijden eigenlijk is. En met wat voor kosten je geconfronteerd kunt worden. En uh, dat in de steden dat mensen heel vaak zullen gaan kiezen voor openbaar vervoer en voor het delen van een auto. Als je compleet, 100% expliciet, de vervoersbehoefte aan de ene kant en de vervoersaanbod aan de andere kant hebt, dan zul je zelforganiserende systemen hebben die daarop inspringen. Een voorbeeld is van, van dorpen, dat, dat het nog vaak ontsloten moet worden met openbaar vervoer. Ja, dat kan zijn dat er drie wat oudere mensen die nog heel veel flexibiliteit in hun uren hebben, nou eenmaal een keer naar de stad willen. Ja, die vinden het misschien helemaal niet zo erg om hun tijden wat aan te passen, dat ze met z'n drieën gaan. En er is misschien best iemand die dan zo even op een heel rij die toch in de stad moet zijn en daar 10 euro mee kan verdienen. Dus dat is een zelforganiserend systeem waar je de behoeften en de, het aanbod van vervoer veel beter op elkaar gaat schakelen. En dat is algemeen wel een kenmerk van het internet en heel die ICT-wereld. Het hele big data verhaal is dat die twee dingen steeds beter op elkaar gekoppeld gaan worden. If you know where all the moving parts are at all moving times, you know the unmet needs and um, the weights and all the information, suddenly you can bring huge uh, productivity improvements and cost improvements just by knowing everything every uh, minute of the day. Ja, die data komt dus enerzijds van auto's, die big data, die allemaal sensoren hebben, die weten precies wat er op de weg gebeurt, die al die data hebben, dus dat je van het vervoerssysteem in ieder geval complete status weet. Aan de andere kant moet je ook data hebben van het aanbod. Waar zijn mensen, waar willen ze naartoe, waar gaan ze naartoe? En ja, je ziet toch met de trend dat mensen steeds meer van hun agenda delen, maar in ieder geval van hun voorkeur en van hun plannen. Dat je daar ook data uit kunt genereren van wat er gaat gebeuren. En die voorspellende uh, gaven van hele grote computers gebaseerd op die data wordt steeds nauwkeuriger. Dat komt gewoon uit al die systemen van mensen die activiteiten ontplooien en daarmee data delen. In Silicon Valley, just south of San Francisco, they know all about making things more efficient by using internet and data. So when several internet entrepreneurs saw that the taxi system didn't work properly, they thought of a better way to connect drivers and people who want to get around town. In San Francisco, we have a, we had in 2009 and prior a pretty terrible uh, taxi experience. You could never get picked up where you needed to be. Um, and people would legitimately be stranded around the city. Uh, so what if you could hit a button and get a town car? And that was the initial idea. They're stuck in the past. I don't, I don't think this industry has innovated in, you could argue, 60 years. Um, and so there's a lot of improvement to be made between the, the current system and where this could go um, with technology and kind of a, an operational efficiency that Uber brings those two things to the table.
I think there's this excess capacity that existed in the supply base that we work with. So folks who typically drove town cars or, uh, or taxis before are now working on the Uber platform and they're just more productive. Um, we're able to connect a rider and a driver more efficiently than ever before. And through that, the drivers are making more money and riders are saving money um, in their transportation needs around a city. So Uber is a technology company, mm -hmm. and we have an application on your smartphone, Android or iPhone or what have you, um, and we will efficiently connect a rider and a driver. So when you sign up for Uber, you put a credit card on file, and you hit a button on your phone, and in five minutes, you have a town car or a Mercedes picking you up. We do look at the data heavily. I mean, I think it's part of our, um, the DNA of our company as an engineering-based uh, company, we, we definitely focus a lot on, on the data so we understand how people move around a city, when and where they will want a particular item. Um, and we pay close attention to that stuff, yeah. I hate it. I'm totally against it. I don't think it's a good idea. I don't think it's... Um, the big thing is because it's popular among young people with the apps, mm -hmm. with the iPhone apps, who feel somehow more uh, certain mm -hmm. that they're going to get a cab because they can watch it on a screen. Mm -hmm. They're fascinated by the, uh, the visual element. Mm -hmm. uh, rather than my position is just make the cab come on time within 10 minutes and you won't need a screen, you know? <laughs> just call the cab and the cab comes. Yeah. But the problem is, if there's no cab near you because you live by the ocean, you will never get the call. You'll never get uh, picked up. And there's nobody at the dispatch, at the cab company, to say to a driver, go and get, you know, the people out by the ocean. In many markets, you know, London, for example, the price can be almost half as much as what you would pay for a, for a black cab in London. And so we've reached a market that's actually, you know, it's, it's just much more mass market and, and more people can use the service and benefit from the, the logistic value that we can bring to the table. You know, there is a car that takes someone to work, it sits all day and takes them home. Um, that one car could be driven by an Uber, an Uber driver. Uh, one of our partners, and, and you know, that's just two trips in his day of, I don't know, 20 to 50 or whatever. Um, and so there's a, there's a lot more efficient way that that asset can be used. Um, as far as mobility and in, in terms of an individual getting around a city, um, yeah, I think that people, you said it yourself, I mean, people are starting to move from um, owning to, to kind of renting or leasing things in general. Uh, you see a bunch of other startups in this kind of sharing economy. Um, you know, we don't throw that word around too much here. We don't think about ourselves that way generally, but, um, but there's definitely an efficiency piece that we're excited about, right? Yeah. And that's, you know, the way people get around the city or the way people own vehicles, whatever it is. Of course, everyone has the image on their mind of a taxi driver or uh, waiting, uh, reading a newspaper. Is that what's happening? Like I think that's that? going away. There may, there may be less reading time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Is, is that what's happening? That there's less downtime for these drivers? That's correct. Absolutely. Uber and similar services are turning transportation in American and European cities on its head. But when it's all about connecting people and transport efficiently, it doesn't have to revolve around cars. In Los Angeles, car city number one, Jeffrey Chernick is working on Ride Amigos, a website that organizes your journey efficiently for any means of transport. I was working in finance in 2007 for a big investment bank in New York City, the typical East Villager taking an hour subway commute to work in my suit at 7 in the morning. And you're, you know everyone's going to the same place. You're either going to Wall Street or Midtown. So I called my, uh, one of my best friends, Evan, and I said, could we build a website that could connect me with a neighbor to share a taxi to work? 
and nine months later, RideAmigos.com was born. Nice going. How are you? Ride Amigos is a transportation center point for a city. It's kind of like a, a farmer's market of a community. So no matter what you want to do, whether it be biking, walking, carpooling, public transit, or as other transportation options emerge, like car share or bike share, it's one website you can go to for the whole community to find all of your transportation options. All they have to do is punch in where they're going from and to, let's say Venice, California, to Santa Monica, what are my transportation options? And then we give them all of these options. And then when they see all of these options, they actually get an interface that compares and contrasts them each. So for example, time differences, CO2, the carbon footprint, calories burned, things like that. So they could actually see back to back what's going to be right for them. Other people do it for the sharing. I, that's why I love it. My passion behind Ride Amigos is the concept of putting two people in a car that would not otherwise interact. Kind of going back to us being human, we forget how easy it is to make friends. And that is so beautiful. For the younger generations that are completely attached to their mobile phone, it's not really necessary to have a car of their own anyway. Soon you're gonna be able to just rent a car for an hour from your neighbor. And that's happening right now. Yeah. So it's it's the technology that we have that's streamlining this communication, mm -hmm. which is what we're already seeing affecting huge changes in behavior. All of a sudden you're creating carpools and van pools and biking information in mass. And the most powerful thing about our tool is the data we're capturing and what we do with that data. How we take this data and better visualize it for a city of how people are getting around so the city and the urban planners can actually make better and smarter decisions saving taxpayers money. That's where things get really interesting. When we were originally pitching venture capitalists, they were just like, carpooling? We're not investing in anything related to carpooling. Sharing rides, just no thank you. Now you look at it today in 2013, mm -hmm. if you look at Lyft and Uber, I mean, Uber is a car service on the fly and they raised $378 million from Google. There is so much money being focused on the road right now that the whole industry is shifting. I think in the end, there will be such a less need to have or own a vehicle that it's going to change the world. Thank you for watching. For more on this subject, take a look at the playlist. You can also watch this recommended video. Don't forget to subscribe to our channel and we'll keep you updated on our documentaries.